Our gospel lesson this morning comes from the book of Luke, chapter 6, verses 17 through 26. Now Jesus came down from the mountain with them and stood on a large area of level ground. A great company of his disciples and a huge crowd of people from all around Judea and Jerusalem and the area around Tyre and Sidon joined him there. They came to hear him and to be healed from their diseases, and those bothered by unclean spirits were healed. The whole crowd wanted to touch him because power was going out from him and he was healing everyone. And Jesus saw this and he raised his eyes to his disciples and said, happy are you who are poor because God's kingdom is yours. Happy are you who are hungry now because you will be satisfied. Happy are you who weep now because you will laugh. Happy are you when people hate you, reject you, insult you, and condemn your name as evil because of the human one. Rejoice when that happens. Leap for joy because you have a great reward in heaven. Their ancestors did the same thing to the prophets. But how terrible for you who are rich because you have already received your comfort. How terrible for you who have plenty now because you will be hungry. How terrible for you who laugh now because you will mourn and weep. How terrible for you when all speak well of you. Their ancestors did the same thing to the false prophet. The word of God for the people of God. And to God we give thanks. Would you please join me in prayer this morning? God, what do you want me to say to your people? What words need to be expressed in response to this scripture, in response to this time? What is, it, what is it that we need to hear? What is it that we need to know? Speak to us, reassure us, guide us in this time of fear and uncertainty, and help us as we look to the future, as we look to what lies ahead and as we seek your glory. Let us be aware of how you are calling us to lead and to serve, to minister and to love. Speak to the fears and doubts inside of us with words of comfort and reassurance. Speak and let us be blessed. By the power of your Son we pray. Amen. God in us, where dwell the brave at heart. Today we are visiting Gryffindor House as we continue in the sermon series, God in Us, uh, understanding of who God is in us and how God works in us, examined through the lens of the Harry Potter series, my name is Julia. I am one of the pastors here at St. Mark's, and I'm also a nerd who is so excited to be in the third week of this study in this series. The Gryffindor. So last week, just to recap, we were talking about Slytherin and having all this ambition and pride and how that's a good thing when you remember to align it with God's will. And then the week before that, we had of Ravenclaw talking about wisdom and intelligence and the importance of sharing that wisdom with others and seeking the wisdom that is God. But today we have Gryffindor, and next week we have Hufflepuff. My house, but... But today, no, focused on today. Today is for the day for bold and brave Gryffindor, the house that values courage and chivalry, standing up for what you believe in, even to the point of foolishness. Sometimes they really do go too far in the series, just saying. It's an exciting time. It's a, an exciting time to talk about bravery and courage, but it's also strange because I, I didn't plan it this way, it just is happening this way that this week it's very appropriate that God led to us talking about courage and understanding this trust in God and when the future comes. 
this week, as some of you may know, on Saturday, uh, the 23rd, that will start a special, specially called General Conference here in the United Methodist Church. And that will last from Saturday, the 23rd, until Tuesday, the 26th. And general conferences typically happen every four years, but this one was specially called after events at the 2016 General Conference, where there was a lot of tension and a lot of disagreement. And the focus of this entire General Conference is going to be figuring out and hopefully making a decision on the way forward for United Methodists around the world in regards to whether or not we will ordain people as elders and deacons in the church who are not heterosexual and whether or not we will acknowledge marriages that are non-heterosexual. We're going to talk about sexuality and there are General Conference has some special challenges to it. Um, for those who don't know, the Methodist Church is designed in a way that is gloriously complicated and yet beautifully simple at the same time. Um, there are many annual conferences, and from each annual conference, there will be an equal number of clergy and laity delegates. So clergy, pastors. Laity, people who are not pastors and not ordained easiest way to explain it. So, and it'll be an equal number from all annual conferences from all over the world. This is not just happening with American churches. This is happening with churches in Africa, uh, South America, China, anywhere there's United Methodist Church, they're going to be represented. And that means we're bringing together a lot of different cultures, a lot of different understandings and readings of the Bible and practices, and, we're, and they're all going to come together and try to make a decision. And right now, there are three plans that are up for vote at this specially called General Conference that will determine the way the United Methodist Church goes in the future. Um, but the thing is, it's possible that at the conference, new plans may be brought up. They may not even vote on those plans. They may try something completely different. We have no way of knowing what's going to come. There's no way to know what the results of the vote will be and what direction the United Methodist Church will take. And so in regards to general conference and what is to come in the future, my answer is the same as Pastor Brian and Pastor Marianne. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen to our church as a denomination and our church here at St. Mark's. I don't know, and that's terrifying. It's terrifying to me as a candidate about to be commissioned in the church and making all of these vows and pledges to stay with the United Methodist Church and not knowing what's going to come. And it's also scary for me as one of your pastors to not be able to give a definite answer of what's going on in our denomination. The only one who knows what's going to come out of this general conference is God. But for the rest of us, we have to wait and see, which is already hard, but then we have to do something else. We have to trust. And not just trust God, but we have to trust our delegates, people we've never met, to listen to God and to make a decision that we feel fits with the scriptures and with our traditions, with our experience, and with our understanding. Now, I know that God is in control. We know this. We believe in this. God made everything, but God also gave humans free will and... Um, that can lead to some interesting results. Earlier, Michelle read to us from the Old Testament, and you know, as I reflected on the scriptures for this week, as I thought about what was to come and what was being said, I found myself really clicking with the words in Jeremiah, 
and they felt disturbingly accurate. Cursed are those who trust in mere humans, in mere mortals. Better to trust in God, our Savior. Again, God is in control. There's no doubt of that. But with that control, God has also placed control and choices in humans. And it's humans who will be casting their vote in St. Louis in the coming days. I'm not, I'm not trying to scare anyone by bringing this up or by talking about sexuality or the way the church works or the fact that we don't know what's going to happen. The goal is not to scare you because there is hope. The purpose of this is that you deserve to know what is happening with the United Methodist Church and I want you to be able to be informed about it and to be able to talk about it because it's very likely it'll be in the news and media and it's going to have rippling effects for at least months, if not years. This is a pivotal moment for United Methodism. But there is still hope. Even as I talk about the struggle of trusting in humans, I want to remind us all that our brothers and sisters in Christ from around the world have been working for over a year on the plans for this conference. And they've been in heavy discussion with one another and near constant prayers to God for guidance. They've put a lot of work into this. And the delegates, I firmly believe, know that this is a big moment and they need to be open to listening to God. There is still hope, but at the same time, there is still this possibility of change in the air. The sense of something different is coming and being unsure of what it is. All over the world and around the country, throughout our state, People have been asking themselves if they can continue to be United Methodist after the, after the decision is made. And people on all sides are asking this question. Can I still be United Methodist, whatever decision comes? Can I still belong? And the question, the response that I want to give to this question is another question. Because in talking about bravery today and placing our trust in God, it seems like the question we should be asking isn't, can I still be United Methodist, but can I still be a Christian? Whatever comes from the United Methodist Church, will you still be a Christian? Regardless of what you believe to be right or wrong, will you still believe in God our Father, our Holy Parent, Christ our Savior and the Holy Spirit who continues to dwell with us? Will you still believe that in Christ we are one body, one family united, never to be torn apart? Because more than being brave and trusting others to make decisions about what is right and what is wrong, I think the real bravery that we're going to have to take on is having the strength to look at a Christian who disagrees with us and still say, you are my brother, you are my sister in Christ, and I love you. And even though I cannot stand with you on this issue, I will still stand beside you. I will still claim you as family, even as we continue to struggle with this and work through what all this means. That's why even when even in all the disagreements between all the denominations, between Catholics and Methodists, Presbyterians, Nazarene, we all have these different ideas of who God is, what the scriptures say, and what we're supposed to do with them, all these different understandings, but that doesn't take away from the fact that in God, we are one. It doesn't take away from the fact that God made all of us and loves all of us equally. It's not going to be easy, not by any means, but, you know, I don't think Jesus ever really said, 
that following him would be easy. He only said it was possible to do so with the help of the Holy Spirit. And it's by the Holy Spirit that we're able to even be together as one body. United Methodists have a tradition that many of you may be aware of, where with communion, we have an open table. You don't even have to be a member of the church. You don't even have to be a believer to take part in the bread and the grape juice. And then we have the baptism. Baptism and communion, those are our two sacraments. Those are where we really find God and we feel God working in us. Because even when we make the choice to have the water washed over us, even when we remember our baptism, when we take part in the elements of communion, it's not just us at work. There is a holy mystery happening. God present and binding us together into one body and one family, one community, in spite of all of our disagreements. I don't know if the United Methodist Church, I don't know what's going to happen to us. But in not knowing, I also take some comfort from the words of Scripture and from the reassurance that Pastor Brian has given from his many years of experience of leading in the church. Because he would always respond with, no matter what comes of this general conference, God will still be God. And in that, we can take trust and no reassurance. God will still be God. And there was another part, piece of scripture that I want to share with you, that it, the context of it doesn't quite fit with this, but it also just felt so right that when I thought about this sermon and what I wanted to say, it just called out to me. From Matthew 19, verse 6, so they are not, no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, humans must not pull apart what God has put together. Now, this scripture is, the context of it is talking about marriage. Jesus is talking to his people and explaining why divorce is wrong in this context. We understand now that, you know what? Divorce is divorce. It's not a sin. You do what you have to do. And God loves you no matter what. That's not the point here. The point is that, is that second part of the verse, that humans must not pull apart what God has put together. Now, God will put people together in marriage, but by communion, by our baptism, we are also expressing that God has knit us together as one family, and it is not for humans to pull that apart. It is not for us to challenge the will of God that says, love your neighbor as yourself. And then there's the gospel reading for today. Happy are those who are poor and hungry, who weep and mourn. Cursed are those who have plenty, who are full and happy. I wasn't completely sure what to do with that text for a while because I thought at first, like, there is so much bravery in this, having the courage to know that God will still be with you. God is still with you even when you're hurting. But what about when you're full? Are you supposed to have the bravery to face the sadness that is to come? That didn't feel quite right. It made me think that maybe with this verse, with this scripture, with what we're doing and saying, maybe the real courage when we're full, when we're happy, when the conference says that what we believe is right, the real courage is to turn and recognize that the people who disagree with us are mourning and confused and hurting, and to say, I love you, and hear, let me give unto you that you will not be empty to actually share with one another, to see the needs that each other has and to look into another person's eyes and see God shining right back at you. That takes a lot of guts. 
It takes a lot of bravery and courage to recognize God in front of you, especially when God is saying something that you disagree with. I feel, though, that with everything, again and again, I come back to this reassurance that there is still hope. No matter what comes from the general conference this coming weekend, no matter what happens in the future, there is still hope, and there is something I want, you to des I want desperately for you to take away from this. God loves you. God loves you so much. God made you. God chose you. And as you remember that God loves you, remember that God loves the person next to you, behind you, across from you, beside you. God loves the person on the other side of the world. And the courage for us is to recognize that love, reflect that love, and validate it. To validate that God can love whoever God wants. God made everyone. And nothing we do will ever stop God from being God and from loving each and every one of us and being there for us even in the midst of these struggles and these, this confusion. You are loved and you are not alone in whatever you may face, in whatever you may be feeling, in whatever comes, even though right now I don't have the answers, I know that I will be there for you if you ask. Pastor Brian will be there for you, Pastor Mary Ann. We've been preparing and we've been knowing that this time of confusion is coming. And we're ready to be there for you and to help however we can and to do the best we can to remind you again and again that you are loved and that you are not alone. And to challenge you to challenge you to be brave enough to look with eyes of God and look and love others. In the respect of showing bravery and courage, I want to ask you now to join me in praying for the delegates who will be representing Indiana. It'll be an even number of clergy and laity, young and old, with different views on what God's will is in terms of sexuality and marriage and who is called to preach and who is called to serve. All these different viewpoints, but I ask you to join me in praying for all of them. Let us pray. Almighty God, we ask your blessing. We ask for you to pour out blessing after blessing upon your delegates both of Indiana and of beyond Indiana. All who are coming, may they know you. May they trust you. May they be open to your word and open to your love and your light. And may they remember that they are called to fill others and not to be filled themselves. God, we don't know what's going to come and we're trusting them to listen to you, but we are also putting our trust in you that through it all, no matter what, you will still be God, you will still be with us, and we will still be loved. For all our fears and doubts, our confusion, our questions, our insecurities, God forgive us and God be with us. May we never, ever feel alone in the days that come ahead. And may the delegates feel your presence and feel your power and your love. And thy will be done, Lord. Whatever may come, thy will be done. In the name of your Son we pray. Amen.